our last discussion explored a couple of techniques to solve optimization problems that have constraints in them. The first was the projected gradient descent method that used a projection step to undo any constraint violations due to the descent step. The second was the barrier method that hid the constraints inside the objective by using approximate barrier functions such as the inverse barrier and the logarithmic barrier. This yielded an unconstrained optimization problem which could then be solved using first order optimality or standard gradient descent techniques. Although these two techniques are nice and work well in simple cases, there are challenges to using them. Projection steps can get too expensive unless the constraint set is simple enough and approximate barrier functions may distort the objective and also struggle to handle equality constraints. In today's discussion, we will study a powerful new technique that can overcome all these limitations. My beautiful friends, this is CS771, Introduction to Machine Learning, and let's go! We will use our running example of minimizing an objective function f of x subject to the constraint g of x less than or equal to zero. The new technique we will study today is based on the simple idea that if we use exact barrier functions as opposed to approximate barrier functions that we used last time, then they will not distort the objective and they should also be able to handle equality constraints. Here is an example of an exact barrier. Given a constraint of the form g of x less than or equal to zero, the barrier function maximizes the value of alpha times g of x, where alpha is a helper variable that is constrained to be non-negative. It's easy to see that this is an exact barrier. If the constraint is violated, the maximization problem will be solved when alpha takes an infinitely large value and thus the barrier function will also take an infinite value since g of x is greater than zero as the constraint got violated. On the other hand, if the constraint is satisfied, that is, g of x is less than or equal to zero, then the best alpha can do is to take a value of zero since the product of a negative and a positive number can never be positive. Thus, the barrier function will also take a zero value in that case. Such barriers can be easily created for other types of constraints as well. If the constraint is of the form h of x greater than or equal to zero, we simply switch to using a helper variable, say beta, that is constrained to be non-positive. For equality constraints, we can simply use an unconstrained helper variable, say gamma. Take a moment to do the calculations yourself and confirm that in each case, the barrier function is exact and takes the value zero if that constraint is satisfied and infinity if that constraint is not satisfied. Be careful to note that these helper variables are not regularization constants. There are two key differences here. First, recall that regularization constants are specified by us, whereas we are actually optimizing over the variables alpha, beta, and gamma. Second, recall that we observed that regularization constants need to be set to a small but still non-zero value. However, as you just saw, the alpha variable will either take a zero value or an infinitely large value, depending on whether the constraint is satisfied or not. Thus, these helper variables are not regularization constants. Armed with this exact barrier function, we can now go ahead and introduce the barrier into the objective and solve the resulting problem. Note that this is a nested min-max optimization problem. The outer optimization problem seeks to minimize with respect to the variable x, whereas the inner optimization problem seeks to maximize with respect to the helper variable alpha. When we use these exact barriers, the augmented objective function we get, that is fx plus alpha times gx, is often called the Lagrangian. Note that the Lagrangian takes two inputs in this case, the variable of the original optimization problem x, as well as the helper variable alpha. Solving the problem using exact barriers has several advantages. There is no distortion, quality constraints are handled very easily. Sure, the new problem still has a constraint in it, but it's a simple positivity constraint. A common way to solve the min-max problem over the Lagrangian that we just saw is by creating something called the dual problem. Our discussion so far has convinced us that the original problem is exactly equivalent to the min-max problem over the Lagrangian since we used an exact barrier function. However, if the objective and the constraint functions of the original problem are nice, 
then it turns out that the problem remains unchanged even if we switch the order of the min-max and make it a max-min problem instead. This max-min problem is called the dual problem and in contrast, the original problem and the min-max problem are called the primal problems. Proving an equivalence between the primal and the dual problems is beyond the scope of this discussion. Note that it is important to be careful while creating the dual problem and not make mistakes. In case you are wondering why did we create the dual problem, it is because it is often the case that the inner problem in the dual can be solved in closed form simply by applying first order optimality since it is an unconstrained optimization problem over x. Let us summarize the process of creating the dual problem. Suppose we have an optimization problem with m less than equal to constraints, n greater than equal to constraints and z equality constraints. We first need to ensure that what we have with us is a minimization problem else our barrier functions will cause trouble with the maximization problem as we saw in our last discussion. Once we have done that, we introduce a separate variable for each one of these constraints. Textbooks and research papers will refer to these variables as dual variables or Lagrange multiplier variables. In contrast, the variables of the original optimization problem are called primal variables. Next, we create the Lagrangian simply by multiplying each constraint function with its corresponding dual variable adding all of these terms to the objective. Take a moment to convince yourself that what we have just created is an exact barrier for each one of these constraints. Maximizing the Lagrangian over the dual variables will take an infinite value if even one of the constraints is violated and a zero value if and only if every single constraint is satisfied. Next, we create the min-max form of the primal problem that eliminates the original constraints and replaces them with the simpler constraints over the dual variables. Creating the dual problem then is a simple matter of flipping the order of the min and the max operations. Now we get to the interesting bit on how to solve the dual. To do this, we first try to solve the inner optimization problem in the dual. This simply asks us to minimize the Lagrangian with respect to the primal variables. This is often possible by using first order optimality since the inner problem has no constraints. Once we have solved this inner problem, we can define this Q function that tells us the optimal value of the inner optimization problem for any value of the dual variables. Note that this completely eliminates the primal variables from the optimization problem and the Q function only takes as input the dual variables. In the next step, we solve the maximization problem over the duals with the Q function as its objective. This is usually done using projected gradient descent or coordinate minimization or some other technique. Once we have solved this dual problem, there are techniques to recover the optimal value of the primal variable as we shall see in a moment using examples. However, please be careful to note that dual variables corresponding to different kinds of constraints must themselves be constrained in different ways. If we make a mistake in specifying the correct constraint for a dual variable, our barrier function will be wrong and we may get nonsensical answers. Let us take a few examples to understand how to create and solve dual problems. The first example we take is that of the so-called ridge regression problem which seeks to learn a linear model. At first glance, there seems to be no way to create a dual for this problem since the problem has no constraints at all. The trick is to rewrite this problem and artificially introduce constraints as we have done here. We have introduced n new primal variables, ri, to denote the residual error in the n data points. Thus, we get n equality constraints one per data point. From here on, the procedure is mostly routine. The problem is already a minimization problem, so nothing to do here. We introduce n dual variables. Note that there will be no constraints on these variables since they correspond to equality constraints. And then we create the Lagrangian. Collecting the variables in vector format allows us to write the Lagrangian in a neat manner. The dual problem is now this max-min problem with two primal variables that are vectors, the model w and the residual z, and one dual variable alpha that is also a vector. To solve the inner problem in the dual, we can just apply the first order optimality principle. Setting the partial derivatives of the Lagrangian to zero with respect to w and r tell us that at the optimum, the primal variables must take values that are linked to the value of the dual variable. 
This is super convenient since it automatically gives us a way of recovering the optimal values of W and R once we have solved the dual and have gotten the optimal values of alpha. We can now use these expressions for W and R to eliminate these variables from the Lagrangian to get a Q function which is now completely in terms of alpha alone. Next, we solve the dual problem that we have found by maximizing the Q function with respect to alpha. This can also be done using first order optimality since there are no constraints on alpha. Once we have gotten the optimal value of alpha, we use the earlier expressions for W and R to get the optimal values of the primal variables. And voila, we have just solved the rigid regression problem in the dual. At this point, you might be wondering what was the point of doing all this? Since the primal problem is already unconstrained, first order optimality could have been applied to the primal itself to directly give us the optimal value of W. Why then did we artificially introduce constraints, create the dual and then solve it? The reason is that these two solutions take different times to compute because of the matrix multiplications and matrix inversions involved here. The primal solution requires us to invert a D cross D matrix where D is the dimensionality of the model vector whereas the dual solution requires us to invert an N cross N matrix where N is the number of data points. To see this, recall that X is an N cross D matrix of the feature vectors. Thus, the primal solution is faster if we have more data points than dimensions and the dual solution is faster if we have more dimensions than data points. In fact, in practice, stochastic gradient descent or coordinate descent can be much faster than computing the closed form solutions. Before we wrap up this example, in case you're wondering why the primal and the dual gave us different solutions for the same optimization problem, it is because they just look different. They are in fact the same solution. Before we look at another example, here is a cool trick that Melbo likes to call the Quinn trick since it allows us to minimize a quadratic function over an interval. This trick will turn out to be very useful later. It turns out that to solve this problem, all we need to do is first minimize the quadratic using first order optimality by ignoring the constraints and then projecting that solution onto the interval. Try proving that this trick indeed works. However, be warned, this trick will not work for general constraint optimization problems. In fact, this trick will not work for general quadratic problems and box constraints even in two dimensions. It only works in one dimension. The next example we take is related to something called elastic net regularization. Don't worry about this name for now. All we want to do is find a d-dimensional vector x whose dot product with the all ones vector is at least r and the sum of whose l1 and half times squared l2 norm is the minimum. Here r is a positive real constant. We notice that the objective has a non-differentiable term, the l1 norm which may make life difficult since we would not be able to apply first order optimality to the Lagrangian later. Fortunately, in this special case, we can get rid of this non-differentiability. The trick is to introduce d new primal variables z1 through zd that encode the absolute value of the coordinates of x. Thus, the L1 norm simply becomes the sum of the zi variables and we impose new constraints that ensure that xi lies between minus zi and plus zi. Now you might argue that since the absolute value of a number is always non-negative, we should have added those as a constraint as well. However, it turns out that that is not necessary. The constraints can never be satisfied simultaneously if we were to try using a negative value of zi. Notice that the objective is perfectly differentiable now. Mission accomplished. We now rewrite this optimization problem in a slightly neater way. Note that we have rewritten all greater than equal to constraints as less than equal to constraints. This is often done so that all dual variables are constrained to be non-negative. Except those for equality constraints of course. And we do not have to worry about keeping track of which dual variables are non-negative and which are non-positive. From here on, it is smooth sailing. The problem is already a minimization problem, so nothing to do here. We introduce 2d plus 1 dual variables for the 2d plus 1 constraints and then write the Lagrangian neatly in vector notation. Note that all of these dual variables will be constrained to be non-negative since all the constraints were less than equal to constraints.
The dual problem is now this max min problem with two primal variables that are vectors x and z and three dual variables, one scalar variable alpha and two vector variables beta and gamma. Now let us solve the inner problem in the dual. Setting the partial derivative of the Lagrangian to zero with respect to x gives us an expression for x in terms of alpha, beta and gamma. As before, this will allow us to recover the optimal value of x once we have obtained the optimal values of these dual variables. Minimizing the Lagrangian with respect to z requires a bit more care. Notice that the Lagrangian is a linear function of z. Since the only term that contains z looks like z transpose the vector 1 minus beta minus gamma. Now, the unconstrained minimization of a linear function is always negative infinity unless the linear function is uniformly zero everywhere. Thus, if 1 minus beta minus gamma is not zero, minimizing the Lagrangian over z will yield negative infinity. Since the dual problem seeks to maximize the q function over the dual variables, this means that such values of the dual variables are useless. The only way to achieve the optima is to have values of the dual variables such that 1 minus beta minus gamma is equal to zero. Note that setting the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to z to zero would have yielded the exact same conclusion. We now use these findings to eliminate x and z from the Lagrangian to get the q function in terms of the dual variables alone. However, note that we also need to take along this new relation that we have discovered between beta and gamma, namely that beta and gamma add up to the all ones vector. Next, we solve the dual problem by maximizing the q function with respect to the dual variables. Melbo likes minimization problems, so we have converted the dual to a minimization problem instead. But before solving this problem, we note that we can eliminate one of the dual variables altogether. Since beta plus gamma is equal to 1, we can rewrite gamma as 1 minus beta and eliminate it from the dual. However, we have to be very alert now. When we are eliminating a variable, we also need to eliminate its constraints. Since gamma has a non-negativity constraint, we need to also express that constraint in terms of beta. After this, solving the dual problem is much easier. For any fixed value of alpha, note that alpha is just a scalar, the optimal value of beta is easily found out by applying Melbo's Quinn trick that we saw a while ago. If alpha is within the interval 0 to 1, the optimal value of every coordinate of beta is 1 plus alpha divided by 2. Else, if alpha is greater than 1, then the optimal value of every coordinate of beta is 1. Putting these values into the objective lets us eliminate the beta variable as well and visualize the value of the dual objective as a function of alpha. Applying the quint trick once more tells us that the optimal value of alpha is 1 plus r divided by d using which we get the optimal value of beta i as 1 and gamma i as 0 for all i. Using this, we can recover the optimal value of the primal variable x. We note that the solution does satisfy the inequality constraint, which is a good sanity check. So congratulations, we have just solved that complicated looking optimization problem by creating and solving the dual problem. To become an expert at creating and solving duals, attempt these exercise problems. The first problem asks you to derive the projection rule for a general ball that we saw in our previous discussion. The second problem asks you to do the same for the positive orthant. Not to be outdone, the third problem asks you to derive the projection rule for a general box. The fourth problem is a simpler version of the second example we saw just a moment ago. For each one of these four problems, can you solve the problem in the primal itself? say using first order optimality or the Quinn rule? If not, create the dual problem and try solving the problem in the dual instead. We have so far explored several ways of solving constrained optimization problems, including projected descent methods, barrier methods, and the Lagrangian dual method. In today's discussion, we did an in-depth study of how to derive the Lagrangian dual of an optimization problem. We saw that we must be careful about the sign of the dual variables depending on whether they correspond to a less than equal to, greater than equal to or equality constraint. When eliminating a variable, we must be very careful to eliminate any constraints dependent on that variable as well. We saw all these principles at work on two example case studies.
we found that modifying the original problem before starting the dual creation process can be very helpful. We also learned Melbo's favorite Quinn trick that comes in handy in several places. So that's all for today. Stay awesome and do join us in the next one.